In Jesus' name. Now begin to pray for God's healing power to be poured over the nations of the world. Let's pray for those who are sick concerning the virus. Let's pray for healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray for the healing of the nations. The Lord says He will heal our land if we humble ourselves and pray and seek His face. We turn from our wicked ways, Father. To get down all over the world, we pray, we cry unto you. Heal the nations of the world uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, heal the nations of Africa. Heal Nigeria. Heal the nations of Europe. Uh, heal the nations of Asia. Heal the nations of America. North America and Latin America and South America. In the name of Jesus. Uh, now begin to pray for a mighty awakening uh, in the world uh, that the church will arise. Uh, as a glorious church. Oh, without wrath, without doubting, without any such thing. We're going to pray right now. And as the Father, let there be an awakening. Let there be revival in your church, oh God. Revival of salvation. Revival of discipleship. Lord, let the number of disciples multiply. Greatly, greatly, greatly worldwide. Now lift your hand and say, Lord, do something new in my life. Uh, do it to God. Today, do something new, Father, in my life in this new week. Uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, in Jesus' name we are praying. Amen. Father, thank you for answering our prayers, receiving our praise and our worship. And thank you, Father, for receiving our prayers even. In Jesus' name we are praying. In Jesus' name we are praying. Well, good morning wherever you are, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are, all over this planet. God is good, and His mercy is enduring forever. Before we continue in the service, we want to confess the word. Yes, hallelujah. The power of life and death is in the tongue. That's right. As you speak, the Lord does it for you and I. Yes. So make sure where you are, as you take the confession, you say it loud, and the angels of God will go on assignment. Bringing to pass all the confessions of our mouth in Jesus' mighty name. 
name say after me i make bold to declare i make bold to declare that i have 2020 that vision i have 2020 vision i have perfect vision i have perfect vision i see clearly i see clearly accurately accurately and scripturally, and scripturally. i am who god says i am who god says i am i can do what god I says can i can do, do. What god says i can do. i see supernaturally, I see supernaturally. beyond all natural beyond limitations all natural when others see a casting when down, see a casting I see a lifting up. I see opportunities where others see difficulties. Where other see difficulties. My, life has focus, My life has focus, direction, direction and, purpose. and purpose. I am disciplined, I am disciplined in, all that I do. in all that I do. I see policies I and rules, rules changing in my favor. I see policies I and rules changed in my changed favor. In my faith. I am an ego Christian. I, I see far. I see far. I saw high. I, saw high. I, am, focused I am focused on my heavenly on mission. My heavenly mission. Because, of my vision, because of my perfect vision, my future is secure. My future is secure. I see myself, I see myself healed, 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 delivered, delivered and, living and living in abundance. In abundance. I daily bring glory to my Savior, to my Jesus, my Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I am a world changer. I am a world changer. Fulfilling God's vision. Fulfilling God's vision. For my life. For my life. In this church. In this church. My worst days my are behind me. Days are behind my best days are before me. My worst days are behind me. My worst days are behind me. My best days are before me. I receive. I receive. The manifestation. The manifestation of this declaration. Of this declaration. Now. Now. In Jesus name. Jesus name. Wow. Let's give the Lord a clap. He deserves a clap for that. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Amen. Amen. And amen. Oh, wow. The Lord is good. And all the time. And all the time. Our Lord is good. Our God is awesome. He is faithful. What a mighty, mighty God we serve. Today we're going to be bringing you a word, and um, we believe that you're going to be richly, richly blessed. Um, you know, we've been talking about relationships for a few services now, and I um, want to deal with a critical part of relationship. It has to do with our hearts, our hearts, the game of hearts. You see, there's a game that people play in relationships, and it's actually a game that they're playing based on what's in their hearts. Those who have a good heart, play a clean game. Those who have an evil heart, they play a very dirty game. And whichever way people play this game, it has consequences. And one thing I found out is that, you see, in life you're going to meet different people. The good, the bad, and the ugly. But I've also found out that what you ultimately become depends on the kind of heart that you have. Because you see, you can't really control other people. People who are bad are going to be bad. People who are wicked are going to be wicked. But if your own heart is a very, very good heart, you will be able to relate effectively with people. For those who are enemies, you will be able to overcome them. We want us to look at a scripture in the Bible. Let's look at the story of Esther. Esther played the game. She was not the one that started that game. She actually got sucked into that game unwillingly. But she would even want to get involved. Now what was going on was that she had an uncle who had raised her as his own daughter. And this uncle happened to be a Jew who was among those who had been captured from Israel when the kingdom of Israel fell. And they happened to be slaves in another empire. And, you know, Mordecai had become a gate man for the king. And so he would sit at the gates, serving the, the king at the gates. So what happened? Look at, Ed, uh, look at Esther, the second chapter. I'm going to read Esther chapter 2. And I'm going to read from the 21st verse. Perhaps, you know, a game is going on right now. Maybe in your home, maybe concerning your work, maybe concerning your business. But what I want you to know is that, irrespective of the circumstances around you, it's what's actually going on is a game of hearts. 
Now, in those days, I'm reading Esther chapter 2, verse 21. I'm going to read a number of verses of scripture, so please be with me. stay with me. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigtan and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther. And Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed. And both were hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. After these things, we go on to the very next chapter. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamidatha, the other guy, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. So what was playing out there? A game of hearts had started. I mean, Mordecai was the one who had done something to protect the king. He is the one who should have been rewarded and promoted. But it wasn't the one that was rewarded and promoted. It was another officer. It was Haman. And so, you know, maybe that was part of why Mordecai felt bad. Maybe that was why he felt he wouldn't really honor this, 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 this new promoted officer. Whatever it was. Then Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were with the king's, within the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? Now it's happened when they spoke to him daily that they would not listen to him. That they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words will stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. Now when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. Haman became very angry. If you were with us in the first service, you know that what, what we dealt with was, was anger and how to overcome anger. So I was filled with anger, uh, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. I mean, how does that work? What kind of heart did Haman have that he would plan to destroy a whole people group, a whole nation of Israel because one man offended him. One person refused to honor him and he became so angry and so offended. Just like, yeah, I'm not just going to deal with that one guy. I'm going to deal with all these people. Now, how do you defeat such a guy? The game of hearts. And in this game of hearts, it's the better heart that is going to win. Now, when Haman I thought was going to destroy God, so he went to meet the king. He said, There's a group of people. They are very terrible people. In fact, they are not useful to the king. Look, king, I want you to just give me permission to wipe out these people. I want to kill all of them. And so the king gave him permission, you know, gave him a signet ring and said, Look, it's a law. Now you can go ahead and kill all these people. Now, when Mordecai heard that that was the decree that had been passed on, now, of course, he had somebody who was the queen, who was Esther. But at that time, nobody knew that Esther was actually a Jew. So Haman did not know that Esther was a Jew. So he was plotting. So anyway, Mordecai went and sent a message to Esther that, look, Esther, You've got to go to the king and plead for the people. And Esther just thought, look, my husband has a law. He's a, he's, he's a man who operates based on law. He's a king that holds principles and love very dear. He said he has not asked anybody to come in. He's not asked me. Even for the past 30 days, I've not been asked to come into his presence. Should I try to go into his presence? And he has one law. And that is that if he doesn't send for you and you show up in his presence, he will put you to death. He said, look, <laughs> I mean, I can't do this thing. And then Mordecai told her, look, if you stay back and you hold your peace at this time, don't think you're also going to be delivered. Because when this killing starts, it's also going to affect you. So what did Esther do? She then said, look, we're going to fast. And I want you to tell all the Jews to start fasting for me. My maidens and I will fast for three days. We will not eat, we will not drink. And then I'm going to go to the king. And if I die, I die. See, that was the first thing about her. That she was willing to lay down her life for her people. She was willing to risk her heart. A good heart could do that to protect people. Oh, I celebrate all the doctors, all the scientists, all the nurses, all the people in the medical field all over the world who are treating COVID-19 patients. We celebrate you. We celebrate you. We celebrate your heart. May God continue to keep you and bless you. Because many 
of these medical professionals and you know risking their lives so that other people can live. That's mm -hmm. what Esther did. Risk and her life that others may live. But how did she play her own game? So after the fasting and prayer, she put on her royal apparel and she went into the presence of the king. And when the king saw her, she found mercy. You will find mercy Amen. in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And the king held out his scepter. And then the king said to her, Esther, what do you wish? So the half of my kingdom is going to be given to you. Amen. Anything you want, up to half. Not the full kingdom, but up to half. I'm going to give it to you. And Esther said, this is my request. I want the king to come to my banquet, but not I want Hema to come to the banquet together with the king. So how was she going to play her own game? She was going to use love to overcome evil. She was going to use kindness to overcome wickedness. That's how she was going to play her own game. She could have said the king should just come for the banquet, and while the king is eating, then you know, then maybe she will tell the king that there's a problem. But she said, I want Hema right. to also come. Listen very carefully to me. When people are being mean to you, you can always decide to show love and God will fight for you. So what happened? She prepared the banquet. The king came. Haman also came. And he was eating. Mm. Did he know that the person who had prepared the food and was receiving him so graciously was also the person that he had been plotting to kill? Did he know? Had he known? Finished the meal. Now listen very carefully to the story. When he finished the meal and he was exiting from the banquet, what happened? The Bible says, as he got to the gate, he saw Mordecai. And when Mordecai would not greet him again and bow before him, oh, he became even more angry. And he went home. He told, he told you know, his wife, he had gathered people together. He was a very boastful person. And the king has done this for me. But nobody was invited to the banquet except the king and myself. That's the only person Queen Esther. Ever. He said, But all this avails me nothing. As long as I see that Mordecai at the gates. He said, The honor I received does not count for anything. What kind of heart is that? A very, very hard heart. Who will not celebrate his own success? He's more interested in the wickedness and evil that he wants to do. And so his wife and all his, you know, friends advised him and said, well, just build gallows. And then when you go to the king, the next day, just tell the king that you want Mordecai to be, to be killed. Now, do you know that when the king and him and got to the banquet on the first day, and the king asked Esther again, Esther, what's your request? What do you want? So the half of my kingdom is going to be given to you. Esther said again, tomorrow I want the king to come again to the banquet together with Haman. So what did she do? Do you know she gave Haman a chance to repent? That if you don't deserve kindness and kindness is being given to you, shouldn't you overlook somebody else's mistakes? She could have made the request the first day, but she did it. She was a woman who had a very good heart. And she played her own game with a good heart. And that was how come Haman's fate was sealed. So the next day again, they came for the banquet. And then the king asked, after they had eaten, said, king, king, Queen Esther, what do you want? Tell me. And then she now said, oh, I want to plead for my people. I want to plead for our lives. Because somebody has plotted to destroy myself and my people. And the king said, who? <laughs> who is the one that has plotted such a thing. Who would imagine such a thing? Now let's go quickly to Esther the let's go quickly to Esther chapter chapter five. I'm going to read verses one to nine. Esther chapter five. Verses one to nine. The king Verse 7, then Esther answered and said, My petition and request is this. If I found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to the banquet which I have prepared for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. So let's jump quickly now to verse 7. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. I'm reading Esther chapter 7 and verse 1 now. And on the second day at the banquet of when the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. What is your request? Up to half of the kingdom it shall be done. 
Then Queen Esther answered and said, if I found favor on your side, okay, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me as my petition and my people as my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. Have we been sold as male and female seals? I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So the king Arasaurus answered and said to Queen Esther, who is he? And where is he? Who would dare presume in his heart, see that, to do such a thing? Who would dare presume in his heart? And Esther said, the adversary of the enemy is this wicked Haman. Mm. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Then the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther pleading for his life. For he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. Now take note. What did Haman do? Haman stood before Queen Esther pleading for his life. The king was so angry the king went out. By the time the king came back in, Esther had moved to the couch and she was now reclining. Haman was so foolish. In pleading for his life that he fell on the couch. Hey, and the king, the Bible says when the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of when Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will you also assault the queen while I'm in the house? As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now Haman, one of the men, said to the king, Look, the gallows 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. They played a game. A game of a wicked heart versus the game of a good heart. And who won that game? The person who had the good heart won the game. You see, Haman, in his mind, he said, come and die. Esther, in her own heart, said, come and die. One was thinking of death. The other one was thinking, no, I'm going to feed you. And what does the Bible say in Romans chapter 12, verse 22? The Bible says, if your enemy is hungry, do what? Feed him. Mm. If he's thirsty, give him drink. He said, you will heap coals of fire on his, on his head. The way you play this game in relationship is not with wickedness. It's not with, it's not with harshness. The better heart is the one that ultimately wins. Now, listen to me. The story could have turned out differently if Esther also had a wicked heart. That story might have ended in a different manner. But Esther had what? She had a good heart. Family relationships is a game of hearts. That's the truth. It's a game of hearts. Sometimes children can be raised in the same family. And one child can be mean and the other child can be gentle. The other child can be loving. You will find at the end of the day that the one with the loving heart ends up enduring more and pleasing pleasing God. The story of Absalom and Ammon was a game of hearts. But how did their own end? Ammon had a bad heart. And I would also say he also had a weak heart. He had a heart that was given to emotions that were improper. I mean, how do you fall in love with your own sister? Then, not only do you fall in love with your own sister, then somebody now advises you. Should Jonathan advise him and said, uh, look, just pretend you are in. Huh? Pretend you are in. Then ask the king to send your sister. And then let the sister come into the very room. Wickedness. Let this, your sister come into the very room. <laughs> and just pounce on her. Ah, don't do what you need to, 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 to do to her. You know the king's son. Don't you have power to do anything? And he listened to that wicked friend. May the Lord deliver you from every wicked friend. May the Lord deliver you from every evil counsel. When people who want to destroy you are giving you wrong advice, may the Holy Spirit open your ears to hear from the Holy Spirit and to discern that that counsel is wicked counsel and you need to refuse it. Anyhow, he did as his friend had advised. And, oh, Tama, beautiful Tama, innocent Tama came in. She got raped. And then after she got raped, then I just said to her, now get away, get away. The Bible says the, hate, the hatred we now had for her exceeded the love. Meaning that what was in his heart originally was not love. It was not love. You see, a man who forces a, a woman is not love. I always say, what well, one person, you know, um, I saw this lady, drunk the lady, forced the lady. The lady woke up and realized that the man had raped, you know, drunk and raped her. And then he told her, don't worry, 
I'm going to marry you. You know, it doesn't work that way. You cannot marry a rapist. It does not work that way. Anyhow, what happened? He drove Tamar away from his house, possibly. She tore her clothes. She put her hand on her head and wept as she went away. And then when she got to her brother, the brother said, Absalom said, as Ammon be with you, don't worry, it's your brother. Keep calm, keep calm, keep calm. Don't lose your voice. Hmm. But Absalom began to plot. Wicked heart, met wicked heart. The Bible says he waited for two full years. Ah, uh ah, -uh. two years! By which time, Ammon had forgotten what he did. Hmm? And the Bible says he didn't speak to Ammon good or bad. He was just neutral. You know, there are some people who are quiet. And you can mistake in their quietness, eh? You can mistake in it and think that, oh, oh, because this person is quiet, I'll just walk over this person. You don't know what the person is plotting. And so he then, after two years, then said, oh, I have this, this banquet. <laughs> Be wary of banquets. <laughs> Evil people should be afraid of, of banquets. Hey! So he took plan. He said, I have sheep shearers. I have God, I'm throwing a feast. So he went to meet the king. King, come for my banquet. King said, I will be able to say, okay, let all the sons of the king come. Say, ah, what they are, ah, let all the sons of the king come. Let him come. Why would he come, ah, king? Let him come. Everybody go and celebrate with your brother. Now the Bible says that Absalom had instructed his servants. When, his, when Ammon's heart is merry, he has forgotten his sin two years ago. Today is the day of judgment. So what did he told them? Strike him down. And they struck Ammon down. And Ammon died. The other king's sons fled. Absalom himself went into exile. But you see, because he had used a wicked heart against a wicked heart, he himself did not ultimately escape. He himself went ahead to revolt against the king, his father. And he ended up dying a painful, miserable death. Cut off his hair that he used to use to boast and all that that was part of his beauty was cut off in the tree. And the donkey that he was riding went away from under him. And, you know, they, they struck him and speared him and killed him right there, hanging on a tree. Mm -hmm. when, we re when we play this game, you cannot play the game of wickedness with wickedness. If you try that, it's not going to end well. So family relationships can go sore if people are dealing with wicked hearts. Work relationships. Sometimes, some work relationships is a game of hearts. Sometimes you're in a workplace and some people don't like you. Sometimes it's subordinates that don't like you. Sometimes it's your boss that does not like you. You know, think of David and Saul. It was a game of hearts. David and Saul too played that game. Saul wanted David dead. But David had a good heart. Look quickly at 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24, we're going to read verses 4 to 6. So, David had been working for Saul as his armor bearer. And he was also a musician that would play for him. And when he plays for him, you know, the demonic spirit that was troubling him would lift. But there was just this wicked spirit in Saul. That he will throw the javelin sometimes at, at David while David is playing. And David will have to be dodging the javelin, escaping. Finally, David decided to run away. And when David had run away from the kingdom, Saul was still so hateful of him. Because he felt that, you know, David was beginning to shine. You know, people were singing about David. He had killed Goliath. David is the one who has killed his, uh, you know, uh, uh, tens of thousands. Uh, Saul has only killed thousands. You know, so uh, he just had this. This envy, this, this bitterness against David, that David had to finally run away. He had to run away from the kingdom. Now, after he had run away from the kingdom, that was not enough for Saul. Saul still continued to look for him. He still wanted to kill him. So on one of those days when Saul had continued to look for him, finally Saul found him somewhere. But... David was hiding. And then it was now Saul that was you know, exposed. 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. I'm going to read verses 4 to 6 very quickly. Praise the Lord. Um, 
Maybe I should read from verse Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines. I was told him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of England. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from Olives and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his mates. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord has said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's room. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him. King David rather said his heart smote him. His heart troubled him because he had caught Saul's womb. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So the Bible says he restrained his, his servants with that. Because his servants were like, why money we have him? Let's kill him, let's wipe him off. He said, no, he may have a wicked heart, but I'm going to do it with the heart. I'm going to play my own game. My game of hearts is going to be played with a good heart, with a sincere heart. And you know, the Bible says that, you know, Saul had finished refreshing himself, he came out, and then David had to now say after him, look, people have been saying that I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a bad person, I'm the one who is looking for you, I'm the one who is trying to kill you, but look, I, look at your robe in my hand. I caught a piece of it, but I didn't kill you. I could have killed you, but I didn't kill you. He said, you see, my father, moreover, my father, you see, you see the corner of your robe in my hand. But that I cut off the corner of robe and did not kill you. Know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. Yet you want my life to take it. He said, The Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As a proverb of the ancient says, Wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. That's the way you play this game. That's the way you play this game. You play this game. Listen to me. Sometimes even in marriage, it's a game of hearts. Sometimes you find yourself married to somebody who is wicked. Maybe a little wicked. <laughs> Maybe not totally and completely wicked. Maybe just a little wicked. And sometimes you'll be a very wicked person. How do you play the game? You still have to play this game, not by being wicked. And you see, that would be the natural tendency to say, oh, Eh, is she so is she so mean, eh? She's so rude, eh? Okay, I know. I'm also going to deal with her. That's not a good game. You know, there was a, a, a there was a couple, and you know, the man, outward appearance, he will seem so cool and gentle. And the woman is the one who seems so expressive, you know, will talk, seems to get angry and all that. So I don't know what she did exactly, but the man just decided he was going to plan for her. You know what he did? So he told the wife, he said, look. I'm going to send you abroad. I want you to go for vacation. So, give me your passport. I'm going to send you know your passport to the embassy. You're going to get the visa and all that, and you're going to you're going to travel abroad. I'm going to make all the arrangements and all that. Ah, the wife was so excited. She began to tell friends. She began to tell people that oh, I'm going. And she went and asked the husband, what, what date am I likely to go? The, the husband gave her the date. Told her the airline. Ah, she began to tell people. She began to pack. She began to pack, she began to prepare. Huh? So on the day that she was not supposed to travel, I was like, okay, where's my passport? Because you know, I always tell you, I don't worry. You know, when she asked for it, my ticket said, you don't have to be in charge of everything, don't worry about it. So finally, on the day she was supposed to travel, she had packed her passport. I was like, okay, honey, you said the flight is 10, you know, let's let's go to the airport, and about four hours to, you know, because of traffic and all that. And the other one looked at her and laughed sarcastically and said, I'm mm -hmm. Want to go abroad? <laughs> you think you deserve to go abroad? Hey, here's your passport. There was no visa in the passport. There was no ticket. The woman was so ashamed because she had told all her friends. <laughs> she was so ashamed. She had told everybody she was coming for her. She hid herself inside the house for one month. She could not come out. <laughs> Wickedness. Sometimes it's the wife that is wicked and me. And they keep playing that game. Unfortunately, when people play that kind of game, the marriage does not survive. When you see siblings that play the game of hearts and play with wickedness, you find out they don't have a good relationship. When work colleagues play the game, you know, and they play well, you find out that they don't endure. Sometimes you see some business partners who play that game. And at the end of the day, the business does not, does not survive. Listen carefully to me. The game of hearts is won by the better heart. 
And our heart determines our attitude, our disposition, our actions, and outcome. Your heart is going to affect relationships. It's going to affect friendships. It's going to affect how you work together. It's going to affect your work. It's going to affect your business. It's going to affect school relationships. It's going to affect it. Some people never get helped by other colleagues because you know, they don't know how to play the game. It's going to affect marriage. So the kind of heart you have determines how you play the game and determines how you come. Now, there are different kinds of, kind of hearts. And I'm just going to go through a number of them, both the good, the bad, and the ugly. The first one is a pure heart. And that's the one all of us should have. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Amen. Amen. I hope you're getting something from this Amen. message. Glory to God. Amen. Let's look at this scripture. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Mm. What does it say? Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. The kind of heart you should have as a Christian is a pure heart. You see, a pure heart will love. A pure heart will forgive. A pure heart will overlook mistakes. Have a pure heart. In order to love effectively, your heart is key. All right? A pure heart means pure disposition towards God, towards friends, towards family, towards your spouse if they are married. Holiness and purity becomes your watchword and your continuous pursuit when you have a pure heart. A pure heart will not sin and will not participate in sin. That's a pure heart. Let's go on very quickly. The second kind of heart is a hardened heart. A hardened heart. In fact, do you know what the number one cause of divorce is? Hardness of heart. Matthew chapter 19 verse 8. Matthew chapter 19 verse 8. Jesus Christ said, Moses permitted you to divorce your spouse because of the hardness of your heart. A hardened heart you know, says, <laughs> I've taken on to this position. As a hard heart, he will hold on to a position stubbornly and refuse to change. Exodus chapter 7, verse 14. You see, Pharaoh, as somebody who had a very hard heart, he made up his mind, I'm not going to let these people go. Even when he kept on seeing the signs and the wonders, he was so hard. So fixed in his position. Listen carefully, the people will make mistakes. In relationship, it's impossible for human beings to not make mistakes. We are all growing. It's a hardened heart that would never forgive and never forget. That's a hardened heart. It's never in the past. They're always thinking, you've done this to me, I'm going to do it back. That's a hardened heart. You know, a hardened heart refuses to hear the word of God or receive counsel based on the word of God. A hardened heart refuses to hear the word of God. Look quickly at Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 12. Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 12. Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 2. Amen? Amen. He says, but they refused, let me read from verse 11. He said, but they refused to hear, shrug their shoulders and stop their ears so that they could not hear. Yes, they made their hearts like flint. Or they hardened their hearts, refusing to hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Thus, great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. They hardened their hearts and refused to hear the law and the words of, of the Lord. A hardened heart refuses to hear the word of the Lord. Don't have a hardened heart. Have a very subtle heart. Have a very gentle heart. Amen? Number three, what kind of heart do you have? And you play this game. What heart are you using to play this game? A naughty heart. That's number three. You know, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28, Eliab, the brother, David the king, who wasn't a king at that time, was just a young lad, that his father had sent to take provision to his brothers. And when he got there, you know, and he was asking, talking to the soldiers, his brother got so angry and said, I know the naughtiness of your heart huh, that made you come, to come and watch the battle. Now, he was wrong about David. Okay, David was actually doing it in the sincerity of his heart. But there is what is also about a naughty heart. What does a naughty heart do? A naughty heart is always looking for adventure. A naughty heart always explores how far they can go. 
A naughty act huh? stays at the edge of causing irreparable damage to relationships. Let me see what I can get away with. That's a naughty heart. Oh, I've done this. They forgive me. Let me see if I can do this or that one. That's a naughty heart. Let's go on very quickly. Then there's a deceived heart. Some people deal with you with a deceived heart. They never think in line with the word of God. The truth is glaring, but they refuse to see it. That's a deceived heart. They will never, you know, they will never follow the word. They will rather follow the world. In relationships, that's a deceived heart. They want to do dating. You know, they want to do sex before marriage. They want to do all those things like, ah, I'm an adult now. And all that. Hello. <laughs> you are an adult, but you are a Christian. A deceived heart. Look at Isaiah chapter 44, verse 20. 20. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 20. It's a deceived heart. The Bible says, as led him astray. The deceived heart will lead people astray. Then there's the stranger's heart. Exodus chapter 23, verse 9. God said, you know the heart of a stranger because we are strangers in the, in the land of, of, of Egypt. How does a stranger's heart operate? Feeling lonely and disadvantaged. That's how a stranger's heart is. You know, a stranger's heart can develop a persecution complex where everything, you know, your work colleagues are just trying to pay you a compliment. You still feel that you know, that compliment, eh, oh, is a ridicule. Yeah, that's a stranger's heart. <laughs> you know, unsure. A feeling of not belonging, inadequacy, a feeling of not measuring up. And sometimes people play, you know, they bring that kind of heart into relationships and it destroys relationships. Then, of course, there's the willing heart. Exodus chapter 35, verse 5. There's a willing heart. You know, always willing to make things work. That's a willing heart. When you bring that kind of heart to a relationship, if you play your game with a willing heart, you are, you're going to win the game. A willing has always worked wants things to work, is willing to sacrifice, is willing to go the extra mile, flows easily with ideas from friends and family members. That's a willing heart. Joins spouses in, in, in projects very heartily. That's a willing heart. When you are that kind of person, when you have that heart, you know, maybe you are even married to somebody who is playing the game differently, but you play your own game with a willing heart, you will get more results. Then, of course, there's the wicked heart. There's the wicked heart. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 9. Huh? The wicked heart is always causing trouble. The wicked heart goes from trouble to trouble. Ah, uh, the wicked heart. Painful to live with, that's the wicked heart. Everything is a fight. Everything is a struggle. Ah, everything must always have an impure motive. You know, a wicked heart has no remorse. A wicked heart has what? Has no remorse. Look at Proverbs chapter 6, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 18. Glory to God. Game of hearts. How are you playing your game? Proverbs 6, verse 18. What does it say? It says, A heart that devises wicked plans. So it's talking about things that God hates. So God hates a heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that are sweet in running to evil. That's a wicked heart. In running to evil. Ah, ah, ah. Okay, so you've seen you've been forgiven. Must you continue to sin? Must you assume that your spouse has this unlimited capacity to love and forgive? Keep shredding his heart. Huh? Or maybe you are a man, you keep shredding her heart. That's wicked. You can't keep making the same mistake just because you feel, oh, my, my spouse is forgiving. No, oh, I know my spouse is forgiving. Oh, so that money we were supposed to save for the children's education fund. Oh, I've blown it again. I've blown it away. I know my husband. If I just tell my husband about forgiving, that's wickedness. Okay? Don't play your game that way. What else? A faint heart. It's only 28. What's, what is it about a faint heart? Easily discouraged. Cannot endure difficult circumstances. They bail out when things get tough. And the, the, the problem with a faint heart is that, you know, they tend to, 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 to bail out of relationships. They don't wait to see the, 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 the fulfillment. They don't wait to see fruit in the relationship. Okay? And then there's the upright heart. First Kings chapter 3 verse 6. And First Kings chapter nine verse four, and the upright heart is what all of us should have. There's also the understanding heart. How do you play your game? Play it with understanding. Play with depth of understanding. That's what thing God gave Solomon, and he made a, a difference. Amen. First Kings chapter three verse nine and chapter four verse twenty nine. And of course, there's the perfect heart. Oh, the perfect heart. God gave David a perfect heart. Do you know that when God was going to look for a king, he looked for the person who had the perfect heart. And that was, that's what David had a perfect heart. Play your game with the perfect heart. Pure. Upright. Amen. Perfect heart. First Kings 15, 14. 
2 Kings 23, 1 Chronicles 28, 9, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. What does 2 Chronicles 16, 9 say? The eyes of the Lord moves to and fro across there to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him. So what am I talking about? When you are playing this your own game with a perfect heart, God is on your side. Glory to God. And God will show himself strong on your behalf. Then make sure your heart is tender. Have a tender heart. Ephesians 4, 32. Have a tender heart. Be loving. 2 Kings 22, 19. Be humble. What was a tender heart? A tender heart is humble. A tender heart is quick to receive correction. A tender heart is quick to receive, oh, oh, is that how I made you feel? I'm so sorry. I didn't mean that. That's a tender heart. And of course, have a kind heart. Ephesians 4, 32. What does a kind heart do? A kind heart is always forgiving. A kind heart overlooks mistakes. That's a kind heart. And then, of course, don't deal with a double heart. Psalm 12, verse 2. Don't deal with a double heart. A double heart is an unfaithful heart. They are here physically, but they are somewhere else emotionally. And when people deal with that double heart, you know, it does not make relationship work. It does not make it, make it, make it, you know, uh, um, uh, um, last. A double heart is never satisfied. They're always thinking somebody else out there will be better. Oh, if I had just married somebody else. Oh, if I had just started this business with somebody else. Oh, if I had just employed somebody else. They're always thinking somebody, somebody else, somebody, a better friend, a better match, a better sibling. Some would even if I had a better father. This is the father you are. <laughs> Praise God. Hey, hey, <laughs> settle it. This is the mother God has given you. Yes, I know she's tough. That's the mother God has given you. Oh, she's so gentle. She's quiet. Sometimes they are talking to her. She just listens. She doesn't talk. That's the mother God has given you. Celebrate her. Amen. All right? Some people will even go as far as hoping for a better child. <laughs> a better child. Hey, don't be, don't have a double heart. And of course, you don't want to have a proud heart. What does a proud heart do? A proud heart is always wanting to be seen as better. That was the problem of Haman. He had a very proud heart. That's why he could not tolerate that somebody will not be greedy. Everybody is greedy. Only to give everybody is greedy. Only one. Ignore that one. Play your game with a pure heart. You know what? Work on your heart. The game of hearts is always won by a better heart. Work on your heart. The game of life is the game of hearts. And you know what? The Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, regard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Play your game, but play it with a perfect heart. Play it with an upright heart. Play it with a kind heart, with a tender heart. Play it Hallelujah! With a very gentle heart. God will be on your side. God will be for you. Your relationship will work. You will be by far a better person when you have a good heart. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's thank the Lord for that word that has come our way today. Amen. Amen. And tell the Lord I receive the right kind of heart. A perfect heart, a perfect heart, a heart that is right before God. That is right before God. That is what I receive. That is what I receive. In Jesus' In name. Jesus hey, name. Amen. 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 Wow, 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 wow. It's been a wonderful day. It's been a glorious day. It's been a blessed day. And a day in which God has given us His word. Um, thank you for those who are helping us to put out the notes on the on the comment section. Thank you very much. You, so people, you can go back and get those scriptures. I saw some people were fast to put it out there. Thank you. I appreciate you. Get the notes uh, from that. Extract it and meditate on this. A lot of information has done for a lot of food for us to feed on all week long. So please hold on to the truth and you're going to see powerful, positive results from heaven. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 All right. One or two announcements. First of all, let me say a big thank you. Um, Thursday was my birthday. Woo! All of you did very excellently. Yeah! Thanks for the notes, yeah, yeah, the calls, the gifts, Woo! and all of that. And my dear wife made it a beautiful day. Oh. I ate all manner of five course meals from morning <laughs> to night, ice creams, and oh, it was lovely. I just wanted the day to go on forever. But thank you, everybody, and help me to thank her. She did a very amazing oh. job. Uh, on that day. Also, we want to announce that on Monday, tomorrow, all the ladies worldwide are gathering a worldwide prayer meeting on Zoom. Am I right? Yes. On Zoom, um, five 
p.m. to 6 p.m. There shall be prayers, lifting up an altar of prayer to God. Please get ready, join, and be a part of it. Invite other people who call other people on, online. This is the time in which we need to pray and not to faint. Amen. Amen. Um, and then on Wednesday, we're going to be back here for another awesome, awesome Hallelujah. service. God has something in store for us. And I want you to know that it will not pass you by in Jesus' name. Amen. 6.30 on Wednesday, we're going to be gathered here. And we're going to be having a glorious time on Instagram and on Facebook. Let people know. Share this on your pages and let people know. Tag people, all the people that you have on your list. That's how you spread it. You multiply it. You tag them and then it goes to thousands of lives. This kind of message will transform homes, marriages, relationships in all kinds, all types. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen and amen. Um, well, you know what? We want you to know that we love you. We want you to know that God's plan for your life will always, always come to pass. And so, remember, uh, well, it's a lockdown in most part of the world. Let's keep on having our hopes high. And let's keep on putting a lot into this time. Do something. Stretch yourself. Do something you've always wanted to do. Write a book. Share a testimony. Um, learn a new skill. And various things you can do. So please, keep on doing that. And also, think about those that have needs around you. And send them something. You know, send them a little bit. But then they may say, well, I don't have billions like the people that are contributing billions. No, it may just be 500 naira, 1,000 naira, 10,000 naira, whatever. Where I come from, they say, that means, I don't know, it's a little something. I don't know, it's because it's little, I will not share with you. No, 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 no. Share it nonetheless. If a little drops of water makes a mighty ocean. Um, so let's keep that in mind. Also, all the natural instructions we're given wash your hands, keep a clean environment, um, sanitize your tables and every area. And uh, uh, of course, if you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you keep on you know, doing all this thing, keep on doing all this thing, and stay indoors. I was trying to remember yes. stay at home. <laughs> That's the big one. Stay at home and stay safe. It will flatten the curve and it will make the virus die quickly if you stay at home. If all of us do it, then it will be a short period in which life will go back to normal as we used to know it. So please keep that in mind. And more than anything else, stay in the Word. Keep thinking. Renew your mind with the Word of God. God is at work for you and I, even during this period. Yes. We are coming out strong yes. on a new level of glory. Hallelujah. We are coming out to do exploits. Yes. So please... See it as that in Jesus' amen, name. Amen, 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 and amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. We'll see you again on Wednesday. Ladies, see you tomorrow. We're praying together tomorrow. Amen. Remember, the game of life is a game of hearts. Yes. Win the game with a perfect pure. Amen. Bye. Wait. Yes.
Yeah. 